All right. Well, thank you everyone uh, for joining. Looks like we've got a pretty decent crowd. May I, we may have a few folks join at the end or as we uh, move for, uh, further into the presentation. But as I mentioned um, earlier, and just in case folks that just joined didn't see uh, or didn't hear, uh, there is a chat function in uh, the Zoom dialog where you can pose questions. We've already have it I already have a few in the queue and some will be addressed by the presentation. Others will cover uh, during one of the breaks for questions in the presentation. But uh, in any case, welcome to the commercial lease negotiation tactics for small business owners presentation. My name is Jake Christensen. I'm an associate uh, attorney at Errant Fox, which is a law firm in downtown San Francisco. This presentation is uh, part of a partnership between the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, as well as the Mission Economic Development Agency, also known as MEDA, uh, and the San Francisco Office of Small Business. And this presentation will be specific to San Francisco. Uh, LCCR does have uh, a little bit older uh, presentation recordings that covered San Jose and Oakland uh, that may be able to answer some of those questions. Before we get started, uh, we do just want to note that uh, this presentation is not meant to constitute legal advice. It is just for information purposes. If you're looking for actual legal advice, uh, we do offer commercial uh, lease negotiation consultations. Uh, they are an hour each. They're free of charge and they're provided by volunteer attorneys like myself. And so it can be a way for you to get some free legal help to at least get oriented, to get a basic review of your lease, to answer any questions that you have. And, you know, worst case, just to have somebody to talk to you about it, to, you know, have someone to listen. Um, we're, we're here and happy to help and um, provide any advice or information that, that would help you move to the next step uh, from where you are right now. In terms of the agenda for the day, how the presentation is going to be structured, it's in three parts. Uh, the first is going to cover the initial step, steps you want to take before you start that negotiation process with your landlord. Then we're gonna go through the relevant protections in the city of San Francisco. And then we will go through the tips for actually uh, negotiating with your landlord and how to go about doing that. So when you are getting ready to review your lease, uh, the first thing you want to do is make sure that you have all components of the lease. Uh, if you've been in the same space for multiple terms, uh, if you are a subtenant uh, leasing from the original tenant, um, if there are appendix, uh, appendices or exhibits or addenda to your lease, you want to make sure you have every part of that document because that is the full representation of the agreement that you have with your landlord or whoever you would be leasing from. Um, if you sublet from someone, you'd want to have your sublease with that person, as well as the master lease, which is the lease between the person you're subletting from and the landlord who owns the building or property. And the same thing if you've leased this space for multiple terms, uh, a lot of leases provide an option to extend or renew, and it simply just requires a, a written communication that you want to exercise that option. There's no new lease. Other uh, tenants may have a new lease for each time they've renewed. It really just depends. So. You just want to make sure you have all of the relevant documents. Uh, if you don't have a lease, which uh, some folks do not, it's just an oral agreement. Um, you definitely want to sign up for a consultation uh, to go over that. It's going to be very specific to the agreement that you have with the landlord, uh, what the history is like in terms of how you've paid rent, what you paid, um, what the other requirements are. So I encourage you to sign up for a consultation and we'll talk at the end how you do that. In going through your lease, um, obviously the best thing you can do is to have a lawyer review it uh, with you. But uh, as you go through it yourself, once you've gotten all the pieces together, you can go and sort of do a pre-review and look for these key uh, pieces of language, key uh, provisions, and that can help uh, guide the uh, lawyer if you end up speaking with one through a consultation or just at least help you familiarize with what might be helpful language. Um, so things to keep an eye out for. Uh, if you see anything that relates to common area or other shared expenses, a lot of your leases might uh, call this uh, CAM fees, common area maintenance fees. These are fees that go to maintaining parts of the building or the space that's outside of 
you know, your, where your business operates. There might be a hallway and there might be a lobby uh, stairwell um, that just helps with the upkeep and, and maintenance of that. Um, and the reason is, you know, if, if other tenants have left or if the building hasn't been open um, and they're still trying to charge you for those camp fees, it's all about trying to identify parts of your lease where there may be room for reduction of rent that's owed um, or possible forgiveness of rent that's already been charged or getting credit for you for that. If there's any mention of the word abatement in your rent or in your um, lease, excuse me, you want to make note of that. Uh, some leases will provide for abatement, which means reduction uh, or potentially elimination or waiver of rent. If there is some sort of emergency where you can't access the building or if the landlord doesn't provide you access, uh, if there's a government action that prevents your access, accessing the building or operating your business. Um, also, if the landlord has an obligation to provide services like janitorial services, electricity, water, if any of those have been cut off, there could be a potential avenue for getting a reduction on your rent. If you see the words force majeure anywhere, um, also make note of that. Force majeure is essentially, it means act of God. And it depends really how your specific leases provision is drafted. But in the event that force majeure includes an act of God that could be interpreted to include a pandemic, um, if it mentions a governmental action, you know, that pre prevents you from operating your business uh, or using the uh, lease space uh, per the uh, intent communicated in the lease, there could be a possibility that you would be able to get a reduction or a waiver of rent during the times that you were forced to be closed because of the government action. Um, many of these provisions do include a qualifier, usually in the last sentence, that says you know, none of this pair, none of the foregoing um, examples in the paragraph will forgive the obligation to pay rent. Um, I've seen that sentence left out, which gives you a little bit more flexibility in terms of raising this uh, provision as a basis for reduction or uh, elimination of rent for the times you were closed, but it's good to keep an eye out for it and just make note of it. If you see anything that guarantees your right as a tenant to use or access the premises, and if that's been interfered with by the landlord uh, or the city or any local government uh, by any reason, um, all, all good to keep an eye out for. You may see a condemnation or casualty provisions. A lot of these are really geared toward uh, the natural disasters that we face in the Bay Area in our history. So earthquake, fire, uh, potentially some sort of like liquefaction or something like that. Um, but it could be written, this kind of provision could be written more broadly that would cover a loss of access or a loss of use due to governmental action, kind of like the force majeure clause we were talking about. So if you see any language like that, just flag it, highlight it, put a sticky there. And uh, if you're in a building with multiple leased spaces, uh, it could be a food court, it could be a shopping mall, strip mall, there may be clauses that require the landlord to maintain a certain occupancy level. And so, you know, if it says that the landlord has to, you know, have a certain number of stores occupied or a certain amount of foot traffic uh, open and operating for a certain number of hours a day, um, that could be grounds for you to terminate the lease. Um, it could give you other rights in terms of reducing your rent or uh, potentially eliminating rent for the months where you were not able to operate your business or where the landlord didn't meet the requirements or obligations under the lease. Anything about quiet enjoyment rights is also going to be helpful. Um, once you sign a lease and are given possession, which is usually when you're handed the keys and the landlord walks away, uh, you do have a right to quiet enjoyment of the space. And if your landlord, as part of your inability to pay rent or being closed during the pandemic, uh, we've seen some tenants where the landlords have, you know, come into the space uh, when the tenant has been working from home and you know, done some demolition or done some upgrading really without the tenant's permission or consent. And, you know, such that even if the space was open, the tenant wouldn't be able to use it. Uh, so there would be other uh, potential grounds for reduction of rent there. If you have a security deposit, uh, which most of you I'm sure do, uh, some probably pretty sizable can be anywhere from a month's rent to multiple months uh, worth of rent. Uh, see if there are any requirements. It's usually a separate paragraph uh, 
for if the security deposit is drawn on uh, a lot of leases will <clears throat> will provide that if you don't pay rent by a certain time five days after the rents due the landlord can uh, deduct the rent for that month from your security deposit and then you have five ten thirty however many days to pay it back and that can be a way for you to eliminate uh, rent that is currently due or um, deferred rent that's unpaid and potentially get the landlord to give you more time to pay back the deposit. And we'll talk more about that later. Uh, there may be other grounds outside the four corners of your lease, depending on the language. Um, so, it, and, and some of that would be uh, the supervening illegality, lack of habitability, uh, also com commercial frustration of purpose. You entered into a lease to operate your business because of government action, because of a global pandemic, you're not able to operate it. Um, so these would all be potential arguments that could be considered uh, once a lawyer has had the opportunity to review your lease and you can sit down for a consultation. Key with going into this uh, you know, process, you've got your lease, you've reviewed it, you've flagged the potentially helpful uh, areas or provisions in the lease. Um, and now you're gonna start to reach out to your landlord. So um, in notifying your landlord, you wanna try to keep an open dialogue be communicative, respond as quickly uh, as you can, um, just so that you're upholding sort of your obligations, even if it's just tell them that you can't pay your rent because your business continues to be impacted. You just wanna make sure that you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing, even if the landlord isn't responding in a timely fashion or if the landlord is being unhelpful uh, or unfriendly. Um, the key with these eviction moratoria both within San Francisco and, and throughout the state is that you, as the tenant, meet the minimum requirements in terms of communication, uh, timeliness, those sorts of things, just to make sure you're doing the minimum to qualify. And that's regardless of whether the landlord is responding. And as you go throughout uh, the communication outreach to your landlord, in addition to maybe making duplicates of your lease documents, uh, scanning them in so you have digital copies somewhere, uh, you also will want to keep hard copies and, and make duplicates of any letters or notices that you receive that are posted on your door or left uh, or mailed to you. Uh, any emails that you exchange with the landlord, you want to save those in a folder uh, on your email account, keep them in a, in a consistent place where you can keep that whole record of communications. Text messages, um, usually a screenshot is the quickest way to do that, but you can on your phone just scroll through, screenshot the, the full thread, and then um, email that to yourself on a smartphone. And voicemails, which obviously are audio, uh, you can't uh, take a screenshot of those, but uh, on Apple and Android devices, there's an option where you can open the voicemail and then email it to yourself. Uh, it just helps to keep a record of all these things in as few locations as possible so that you have the full record of, of all interactions with your landlord should you need it down the road. Um, if you have a business interruption insurance policy, I'm guessing a lot of you do, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but you want to make sure you, um, locate that and buzz through it. It can be helpful for the lawyer that's assigned to your consult to also take a look and we'll, we'll explain why, uh, in the third part of the presentation. Uh, but for now, I see we have a couple questions that came in. I'll review these quickly. And then if you have any more. Uh, questions, uh, feel free to add those, or if you want to raise your hand and unmute. Uh, if you have questions about the section we just went through, that's fine. Otherwise, we can go through them later. I think I just sent the questions um, in numbers for as they came in. Okay. Uh, so hopefully that's easier to read than scrolling through the chat. Sure. Okay. Okay. Very good questions. All right. So. All right, so the um, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors Ordinance, we'll talk about that uh, in this next segment, actually. Um, for the guarantors question, um, for those that aren't familiar, so sometimes when you sign a lease, um, sometimes you'll sign it at, if, you, if your business is um, an LLC or a corporation, um, some other entity that's not just you, um, Sometimes the, the entity will sign the lease. Sometimes there will be a personal guarantee such that if your business um, 
closes or goes under, files for bankruptcy, then you're still on the hook individually uh, for the obligations not met under the lease. Um, and in this case, I, I would probably need a little bit more information to answer the question. So I would encourage you to sign up for a commercial lease uh, consultation. But in terms of clarification about guarantors and the lease termination clause, um, the question is, are guarantors protected from repercussions as well as tenants? And so there could be a situation where, um, say your lease is ending on time uh, at the end of March and uh, you owe a year's worth of back rent that's not been paid and you're closing your business and uh, the business is basically winding down uh, and anything that is left in terms of selling off equipment or uh, any assets for the business would be divvied up amongst the creditors, uh, even if it didn't satisfy all the debts. If you have a personal guarantee, then the landlord could um, come after you in a personal capacity uh, to try to access your personal funds or personal property to try to satisfy the unpaid rent. Um, but in that case, you know, that's speculation in a hypothetical. Um, so you really would want to sign up for a lease consultation so that someone could look at the specific facts and answer your question. Um, all right, question three. Um, so question three is really about, um, whether the, the board ordinance applies to office spaces. Um, and we're going to talk about the ordinance here shortly, but that's again, going to be a more specific question that needs to be answered during a consultation, uh, to take a look at your lease. Um, same thing with about the ordinance po possibly being overturned. We'll cover that. And in terms of renegotiating your lease, we'll talk about that toward the end of the presentation in, in terms of how that might work and, and why you might want to do that. And uh, there's a question about business interruption insurance and whether that's different from a commercial insurance policy. It is. Um, so the, com uh, the commercial insurance policy is usually um, in the commercial uh, sense, it's akin to like a renter's policy. If you rent an apartment, in this case, it's going to ensure the space that you're in. Business interruption insurance is typically meant to cover losses suffered due to some sort of interruption in the business, whether it's from uh, a fire in the building or some other event, uh, natural disaster. And uh, there's been some debate uh, as to whether business interruption insurance would cover losses because of the pandemic and whether the policies uh, included that type of coverage. And we'll talk about sort of this, the differences there in the cases that have come up so far. From the, the mortgage, um, or excuse me, from a, a landlord perspective, um, there there are um, certain parts of the the board of supervisors ordinance that includes relief for um, or includes an exception for landlords that uh, own uh, below a certain square footage of space. So if you're like a mom and pop uh, landlord, you only have uh, one or just a few properties under a certain amount of square footage you can apply for an exemption to the ordinance that would allow you to evict a tenant that's not paying rent. Um, and I'll talk about where you can find that uh, information on that later on. All right. Oh my. All right, just in the interest of keeping the presentation going, <laughs> since I think five or six more questions have come in uh, since I uh, started answering them. We'll keep going with the presentation. I will pick back up uh, after the question that I just answered and then keep going with those. And some of them may be kicked toward the end of the presentation, but um, I'm happy to stay on and, and answer those till all the questions are answered. All right, so um, specific to San Francisco, what are the protections that are currently in place? Uh, so right now, uh, San Francisco has had a, a commercial lease, or excuse me, a commercial eviction moratorium in place since uh, last March, March 2020. And it, uh, until recently, it was extended in, until the end of March 
2021. And it, uh, at the end of January was extended through the end of June of this year by an executive order issued by Governor Newsom. Uh, it applies to businesses that have been financially impacted by the pandemic that are registered to do business in San Francisco and have gross receipts at or below $25 million as of uh, the end of the year in 2019. Uh, this includes qualified commercial tenants, so meaning you have a commercial lease and you operate a business. Uh, you have, um, you're a subtenant, so meaning that you sublease from someone who previously occupied the space or has a lease, and then they sublease to you. And it also includes month to month or holdover tenants. Uh, you may have a month to month agreement with your landlord. Um, sometimes if you have a lease that was like seven years and as part of the renewal, you just agree to go month to month. Maybe your lease ended uh, and you didn't sign a new lease, but you continue to operate in the space. Um, you would be technically a holdover tenant. And so the previous lease applies, it's just on a month to month basis, but it really covers all kinds of tenants uh, that uh, it, as long as they're in that commercial sense and meet the three requirements on the pr previous page. Uh, in terms of what's included in rent, uh, in terms of what you don't have to pay or what's deferred during this period, uh, it includes not only the monthly rent, but any additional rent, which a lot of leases will have a, a provision for that, um, would include a security deposit, so paying that back, um, any late fees, any interest. Um, so sometimes a, a landlord will say, well, okay, your rent's deferred um, during the moratorium, but you, know, you still have to pay your CAM fees or whatever. Um, that is not correct. Um, the landlord can't require you to pay any of these sort of tertiary uh, fees in addition to your rent, uh, as long as you meet the requirements of the moratorium. In terms of claiming uh, protection, uh, you're gonna provide a written communication to your landlord uh, at or around the beginning of each month. Uh, you are going to say that you, your business is financially impacted by the pandemic and that uh, you're not able to pay rent for that month for that reason. And it gives you another 30 days to pay the rent for that month. If at the end of the 30 days, you're still unable because of the state of your business, you provide another written communication, which extends the, the period another 30 days. And that can go on uh, right now through the end of June, uh, as long as the moratorium is in place. It's important to continue to keep an open dialogue with the landlord in terms of discussing the payment terms. Um, you know, being communicative about what's realistic for your business, what you can and can't do is, is really important. Um, there can be an assumption sometimes that, well, you know, businesses are reopened and people are going to come flooding back. Uh, but really when you're, you know, forced to be at under 25% occupancy uh, in terms of foot traffic in shops or, you know, even for indoor dining, uh, you know, it's still in the early part of the recovery though we are going in an upward trajectory, which is good. And it's just important to make sure you do this every month. If you have been sort of communicating with your landlord informally and you have a good relationship and you're texting or um, talking on the phone, it can be helpful just to create a written record. And maybe for April, just say, you know, as, as we've discussed in previous months, you know, my business is impacted, it's not able to be open or it's at severely reduced capacity, financially impacted by the pandemic, uh, not able to pay rent this month either. Um, to the extent you can sort of correct the, the previous months where you didn't provide it in writing, you can do that moving forward. Uh, it's important to note that um, you're not required to pay any rent during the moratorium, but uh, you are encouraged to pay what you can. Um, you know, for every dollar that you don't pay during the moratorium, realizing that in some situations, there just may not be any income to do that. Um, you know, the more that you can pay now, uh, the smaller the pot is going to be once the moratorium ends uh, in terms of deferred rent so that you can, you know, pay things back quicker and, and get back on a, an even keel so that your business can move forward. Once we do have the majority of folks vaccinated, things are fully reopened and uh, we start to get back to normal. Your landlord also um, can agree to additional extensions. So there are specific requirements, uh, minimum requirements, but you and your landlord can work out your own deal, giving you more time to pay back deferred rent, um, different ways of paying rent uh, in terms of how you calculate it. It's really up to what your landlord uh, is willing or not willing to do. And it's important to note that just because the rent uh, doesn't have to be paid now, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have to be paid eventually. 
it is deferred rent, not forgiven rent, unless you and your landlord work out some separate arrangement. So um, you are still going to owe that rent that was due uh, in previous months. And uh, it's just important to note that um, unless there is a, a common question has been, can my landlord raise my rent during the pandemic? Uh, if you're coming up on your yearly renewal, that sort of thing. If the lease as it existed on or before uh, March 17, 2020 provided for annual increases and things like that, that's totally fine and permissible. If the landlord is trying to add new requirements or penalties, things like that, um, that would be a different story. So that would be a good subject for a, a lease negotiation uh, consultation. And key to this is, is what the moratorium means uh, and what the effect legally that it has is that your landlord can't evict you without providing you with written notice of the intent to evict and giving you an opportunity to pay back the missed rent. And so these two parts work together where the landlord has to give you written notice, has to give you 30 days. You can provide you know, the written explanation that because of the pandemic, you're financially unable to pay rent, and then it gives you another 30 days. So as long as you, the tenant, and you, the landlord, are communicating regularly, um, the moratorium is still in play. Um, if, the, if you, the tenant, are at least providing the notice every 30 days in writing, even if the landlord's not you know, responding, it could be possible that you provide the written notice that you're unable to pay and the landlord hasn't provided written notice of intent to evict. Maybe you guys are you know, keeping an open dialogue and trying to work something out. Um, it's just important that the tenant does that, uh, provides a written notice every 30 days. And it's important because the landlord can't evict you for missing payments um, while you're trying to work something out. So it's really important to keep up communication, keep an open dialogue and try to come up with some sort of plan. Um, key to the eviction moratorium though, is that uh, it covers missed payments due to uh, the pandemic. So if there are other issues with creating a nuisance or you know, other violations of the lease, there could be a possibility where the landlord would have grounds for eviction. Um, but if it's just because you're not able to pay rent due to the pandemic, there's no basis for eviction at this time. Uh, subject to the exception that I mentioned earlier, um, where landlords who um, only have a few properties or lease under a certain amount of space can apply for waivers um, based on hardship if the tenant is not paying rent. And it's just good to remember um, that if you haven't paid all outstanding rent, either based on the agreed upon repayment period with your landlord or um, after the moratorium protections expire, then the landlord could um, file an action to recover the remaining unpaid rent or could commence proceedings to try to evict you for non-payment. Uh, we had quite a few questions in the chat box about the December 2020 Board of Supervisors Ordinance. This is something that's still really new and um, haven't quite seen exactly how this is going to work and uh, how it will operate in the long run. But based on the language of the ordinance, it creates different tiers of commercial tenants in the city and county of San Francisco, uh, tiers one through four. If you are a tier one tenant uh, and you have 10 or fewer full-time employees, you have uh, up to two years to repay each month of deferred rent. Uh, so it just gives you a longer built-in timeline uh, to repay the missed rent once the moratorium expires. And there's also a new option that allows a tenant to terminate uh, if the landlord and the tenant aren't able to reach a mutually satisfactory agreement uh, on repayment of deferred rent during the moratorium period. And so if you reach an impasse, the landlord is, and the tenant are not you know, coming to meet in the middle, then the tenant under the ordinance can provide a 30 days uh, written notice of intent to terminate and um, has to pay all rent that is deferred or has been unpaid up to that termination date 30 days later. If you are a tier two tenant, uh, that means you have 10 to 24 full-time employees, gives you up to 18 months to pay back the deferred rent. In the next tier, 25 to 49 full-time employees, up to 12 months to repay. And if you have 50 or more full-time employees, uh, you have to pay the deferred rent uh, no later than when the moratorium uh, period expires, which is currently uh, June 30th, 2021. So um, the rent would be due no later than July 1 of this year. Um, key to the ordinance, it also does prohibit landlords from assessing interest or late fees on the missed payments. Usually under a lease, it's going to provide for um, if, the, if the rent is not paid after a certain number of days each month, 
um, there is an interest uh, charge applied to that, as well as late fees for each occurrence. And um, it also prohibits landlords from charging penalties or fees uh, in connection with the, the early termination, if that's the case. Uh, but it's key to note that landlords and tenants can negotiate and enter into agreements on terms that are different from the ordinance. But if the parties don't agree, then the ordinance is what controls, at least for now. And so I know we had some questions. Let me kind of go back through these here. So um, I think I've already covered the first one where, you know, the landlord and the tenant can can come to a different agreement, but it does say that the landlord can impose additional penalties if the tier one tenant specifically who qualifies does elect to terminate, but you have to meet that impasse requirement. The landlord can't just unilaterally terminate. There has to be some effort to find a solution. And if it comes to a point where the landlord and the tenant cannot agree, uh, then the tenant does have that option in the tier one space. Um, where else did I see? So there was also a question about um, if you're a tier one tenant and you elect to exercise uh, the early termination option and potentially the ordinance is overturned, which there has been some chatter about that, uh, potentially the ordinance violating the California constitution. Um, usually in that situation, um, it's, it's on a going forward basis, um, whereby you know, if you previously relied on the, the ordinance to terminate early and then it's later found to be invalid, um, it would just stop it there. Um, so generally should be fine, but it would really depend on the court that looks at it and what the ultimate decision of the court says in terms of any limitation to retroactively invalidating any uh, terminations that were based on the ordinance if it is ruled to be uh, improper down the road. Um, trying to see if we have other So I do see there was a question, the guarantor question came back up again. Um, for if you're a guarantor on the lease and you have unpaid deferred rent, uh, if you the, if the business is not able to pay that unpaid deferred rent and you personally guaranteed the lease, then the landlord could uh, potentially exercise that option to, um, to pursue payment of any unpaid rent up to the early termination date from the guarantor. Oh my, so many questions. I think some of these questions are very involved. And so I, I'm going to try to answer the simpler ones to the extent I can, but just for the benefit of everybody's on the call, since I see there are about 54 of you here, um, the, the very involved questions are going to be tricky for me to answer. Um, and so it, it may be best in that situation to, to sign up for a, a lease consult just so that you can talk through these questions during the free hour. Um, it's, it's hard to answer them in a vacuum without having seen your lease and kind of gotten the lowdown on your situation and conversations with the landlord that you've had up to this point. All right, some other questions here. So if your lease has ended uh, at the natural, it's at the natural end of its term, say it, extend, it ends at the end of the month, um, the landlord doesn't have to renew the lease, but the landlord also can't necessarily evict you. So you could elect to uh, hold over, uh, which means you, you remain in the space and then you still continue to pay rent um, which if you're not able to under the moratorium, you would be covered as a, a holdover tenant. Um, but just because your lease is ending, um, you don't necessarily have to vacate the space. Ideally, you would come to some sort of new arrangement, whether it's a month to month lease or something with the landlord. But um, if you're you know, not able to pay rent and because of the public health emergency, uh, there, there is some argument that you would be able to stay in this space, at least for now. And correct, as I mentioned under the ordinance, there is an op option to terminate the lease early, as long as you meet the requirements that I mentioned. Um, there was a question about, um, there, there's a note in the presentation that you don't have to provide a financial 
statement or letter from an accountant. Um, all, the, all that the moratorium requires is that you provide a written communication to the landlord that you, the tenant, are um, financially impacted by the pandemic. There may be requirements in your lease that you know say that you are required to surrender within five days financial statements on demand from the landlord. So it's important to note that if you have any requirements in your lease that are along those lines, um, that's something you would want to comply with. But to qualify for the ordinance or excuse me, the moratorium itself, you just have to provide a written communication saying that your business is impacted. Um, if you want to provide, you know, a profit and loss or a monthly receivables statement to kind of show the impact, you know, to your revenue, you can do that. Um, but it's not required unless it says so in your lease. And that sort of goes to what the, the landlord can ask as well. Um, the landlord can ask the tenant to provide it, but unless the lease requires it, the, the tenant does not have to provide any documentation to substantiate um, the financial hardship, which financial hardship is pretty evident um, based on the way that the closures in California, particularly in San Francisco, have gone. If a business hasn't been able to be open, if they're not bringing any business in, um, you know, I there have been landlords that have asked tenants to apply their PPP funds to their rent or assumed that because you got PPP and you're open at 25%, you can pay full rent. And that's really not realistic, uh, at least in most businesses cases. Um, and so PPP to have it forgiven, you have to spend a certain amount of it on, um, on covering salaries and employee wages. Some of that can be used for rent, but not all of it. So this really goes back to both the landlord and the tenant engaging in an open dialogue, being flexible, trying to get through this, you know, the last of this tough time until we can hopefully get back to some sense of normalcy. Um, all right, so I've gotten through some more of these. I will keep going once we get to the next part of the, um, at, through the next part of the presentation and um, try to get through as many of them as we can. All right, so in terms of negotiating, I know we do have a lot of landlords on here uh, as well. Uh, and so, you know, coming at this from the perspective of both tenants and landlords, um, I'll kind of speak through that. But it's key to remember that as a tenant, um, you know, you need to keep in mind the landlord's goal and the landlord, it can be helpful if you keep in mind what the tenant is going through, right? So um, there is, quite a bit of vacancy in terms of commercial space. And so it really is to both parties advantage to work together to try to keep the tenant in the space to the extent that it is feasible that the business can recover and you know get back up to full steam. It's easier for the landlord to keep a current tenant versus having to go through the eviction process or have an, a non-paying tenant um, or a space that you can't you know relet because there's just so much vacancy right now. Um, and it's advantageous to the tenant, you know, to try to keep operating the business and make it through the last of this so that, you know, you can get back to how your business was operating before the pandemic. Um, and the key here as a tenant is to get the landlord to come to the table to negotiate, but then also uh, from the landlord side, you know, getting your tenant to come and, and be willing to try to work something out. And so it really is about visualizing what, what your ultimate goals are. If you're a landlord, you know, you want to get paid as much as possible, if not the full rent. If you're the tenant, your goal is to keep your business going and also not go under because you're trying to pay as much rent as possible, possibly, you know, not paying your utilities because you're paying more on your rent or you um, have no personal income set aside to take care of your personal bills and needs and expenses because you're trying to pay as much rent as possible. So even though it is, you know, a, a difficult time right now, if you can work something out to get through it and you know work out a plan to make everyone whole and happy you know eventually it just works out better for for all sides and so um you know you as a tenant it really is important to make an ask that's realistic um and when i say that it's looking holistically at how your business is done pre-pandemic and during the pandemic um, we have some frames of reference you know when we slid down into the purple tier the last time and things reopened in, in the fall, you kind of saw whether business was picking back up or if there was still a little bit of a lag. Now that we seem to be on a more set path as you know more folks are vaccinated and the reopening will continue to expand, um, you know, hopefully that just means things are gonna keep getting better. 
but you know, it really is to both the landlord's benefit and the tenant's benefit to, you know, make a realistic ask it's something that you can feasibly do. So you don't want to say, well, we're reopened now we're in the red tier and um, I can now pay full rent uh, at pre pandemic levels. And I can also pay 5,000 a month toward my deferred rent. If you can, that's great. Um, but you know, if you, if you over promise, You've gone through all these steps with your landlord. Your landlord has dedicated time, you know, tried to work with you, come up with a solution. You made a promise that you really can't keep. And so it's going to lead to repeated renego renegotiations or you're not going to be able to, you know, pay the, the agreed upon uh, payments after a month or two. And then you've got to start the process all over again. You're frustrated because, you know, you committed to something that you really can't do. The landlord's frustrated because you have to go through this process all over again. So it's good to kind of start on an even keel, which again goes back to the open dialogue and having those conversations. Um, like all negotiations, both from the landlord's perspective and from the tenant's perspective, you know, ask from, for the best case scenario, right? So if you're the tenant, you may want to ask for abatement of, uh, your rent during the times when you were closed and abatement is a reduction or potentially an elimination of rent when you weren't operating. Um, you know, the landlord may ask for partial payment, you know, during the time you were closed uh, versus full payment. It's all about kind of finding ways to meet in the middle. Uh, if you um, need more time, you know, the moratorium right now provides certain time periods up to two years, 18 months, 12 months, um, depending on your business size to pay back the deferred rent, um, you know, maybe there's a more lucrative uh, repayment plan that um, would, you know, work for all parties where it just gives you the tenant more time to pay things back. Um, you, if you have quite a few years left on your lease, you, you could tie it to the end of the lease. Maybe it has to all be repaid by then. Um, factoring in, you know, reductions of the deferred rent or rent moving forward can all help with this. And, um, that goes right into the extended repayment for, for rent that was missed during the shutdown periods. Um, some tenants have uh, applied for a loan um, either through the, the EIDL, I think it's Economic uh, Injury Disaster Loan uh, or different loans through your, your financial institution where um, you're able to get a loan that covers a deferred rent. You're able to get current with your landlord again potentially reach some sort of agreement where you pay a reduced rent for the next six months or whatever period. And that way you have a, a low monthly payment to pay back the deferred rent. The landlord has been made whole for the deferred rent and you have something workable moving forward as you know, the business starts to reopen and there's just less pressure all around. Um, which, you know, if the landlord is willing to give you more time to pay back the deferred rent, it functions the same way, um, but it's just another option. Um, there could be an option to credit deposit toward back rent. Um, if the landlord already has $3,000, $6,000, $12,000 um, in a trust account or in the landlord's account, um, it's just sitting there. Um, if the, you know, the landlord's willing to give you more time to repay the deposit or tie it to you know, a certain goalpost, maybe within two years, you have to pay the deposit back. But it's an easy way to cut down on the deferred rent that makes it more easy for the tenant to pay it back um, in general and potentially uh, more quickly. And um, just an, an option of, of some money that may be sitting there already that hasn't already, if it hasn't already been uh, applied to the deferred rent. Um, if there's an option for forgiveness of back rent um, to the extent that that's something that is financially feasible for the landlord. Um, I've seen some uh, successful negotiations where the landlord forgave all or part of the back rent if the, the tenant committed to pay full rent moving forward, which could be workable. So it's really, you know, both of you, the landlord and the tenant coming to the table with what your, you know, your best case scenario is, and then also what's going to be workable for you too, so that neither side is committing to something that's ultimately not going to work and you're going to have to start over. Um, you know, if your lease is about to end, um, both from the standpoint of the landlord and from tenant, um, you know, the amount of space that's available right now is creating a pretty competitive market. And so this goes back to it being easier to keep the tenant in the space that's already 
built out you know to the tenant's needs it doesn't require the landlord to you know hard shell it and get new permits and have to do different uh upgrades and you know new city mandated things that came up since the last time you know you had to get permits there's always new things that the city likes to throw in and so if if um you aren't able to reach an agreement your tenant's lease ends and the tenant walks away free and clear then you know you're faced with having to find a new tenant and in a pretty competitive market um and then also face you know additional costs with building it out meeting new code requirements things like that so to the extent it's workable for both of you and you know everyone's still getting along trying to to work out a way where there may be extended deferral or reduction or forgiveness for some of the deferred rent if you sign a new lease for a certain amount of time um all different ways to to try to work work around um, the deferred rent or um, future rent um and you know landlords if you're receiving mortgage assistance which not everyone is it really depends on who you're banking with um and you may own the property outright um so you don't ha have any debt on the building which can be its own set of issues if it's your sole source of income but to the extent that you the landlord are receiving any assistance and can work with the tenant to both kind of work through this this time and, and get to a, a spot where you can uh, both kind of get back to how things were before um, that's all good and um, i know in many of the cases in both the landlords and the tenants that i've talked to the relationships pre-pandemic were great tenant always paid on time landlord met his or her obligations you know serviced the the property is required under the lease everyone got along great and this is a you know, a terrible global pandemic that no one, you know, is at fault for. And uh, to the extent we can all kind of help each other get through it, uh, we can kind of get back to how things were before, maybe without handshaking and maybe with more mask usage. But um, in terms of repayment options, some tenants have proposed and landlords have accepted um, either future rent or repayment of deferred rent based on a percentage of monthly revenue. Uh, so instead of saying, um, you know, I can pay 2,900 a month, uh, you know, through the end of 2021 and we'll revisit it, maybe say that, um, you know, 25% of the tenant's revenue will go toward rent um, or 5% of the revenue will go toward uh, deferred rent. And this can be beneficial to both parties in that the Tenant doesn't have a crystal ball, doesn't know what business is going to be like, doesn't know, you know, if folks are going to come back into the yoga studio or come back in for coffee, even when, you know, we can do indoor activities and things. And, you know, this at least it functions in that it doesn't overcommit the tenant so that the tenant is not meeting agreed obligations. Um, and it also, you know, satisfies some of the landlord goals in that the landlord is getting something every month. It might not be the full rent. Um, but there's going to be some percentage of, of what the revenue is that's coming to the landlord. Um, other uh, folks that I have worked with have looked at what they were paying in rent before the pandemic and divided that by the sort of average uh, revenue uh, that was brought in by the business to figure out what the percentage might be, a, what percentage might be appropriate, whether it's 20%, 25%, 35%, and then that applies to what you're bringing in now. And key to this also is if the businesses really come back and you know we're also fed up with being stuck in our houses that um you know things are are better than they were before businesses is booming and folks are back and shopping and eating and drinking and all these things um, there's a potential that the landlord could get more rent uh on the percentage model in the long run than they would have under the you know, per per month uh set amount so all things to think about it, it really depends on what what it's going to work for both of you and so both for the repayment and the base rent, um, you know, considering that percentage option. And that this goes on both sides. Um, so if the tenant is not working with you, is not responding to you, um, on the other side, if the landlord is being unreasonable, threatening, emotionally abusive, tenant or landlord, you know, neither the landlord nor the tenant needs to compromise his or her sanity. So, um, you know, you both wanna meet your requirements under the moratorium, which is primarily on the tenant to provide written communications of what's going on with the business financially what you're able to do um, to the extent you can keep things civil and whether that means you know going through a property manager um, or just communicating by email things can get a little bit more heated on the phone or vice versa honestly um, whatever is going to be the path of least resistance to keep the communication and the dialogue going 
without you know tempers flaring or frustrations as I know we all are experiencing right now. Um, it's just good to take care of our, ourselves, but then also make sure we're meeting our obligations uh, to each other as tenant and landlord and under you know the lease or whatever operative instrument is there. So in terms of uh, next steps, reopening in San Francisco is, is progressing uh, quite well. Uh, we just moved into the red tier. So indoor dining has come back uh, and is rolling out. Uh, there are um, more businesses that are able to open up for indoor shopping. Our test positivity rate uh, keeps going below 1% and uh, one in four San Franciscans have received at least one vaccine dose. So we are progressing in the right direction. Um, could move into the orange tier for the first time, which is exciting uh, if we keep training in this direction. So um, as I mentioned, things just appear to, to be on that path, uh, at least in San Francisco. In terms of uh, defenses to non-payment of rent or bases for reduction of rent that we talked about at the beginning, um, you know, it all depends because these cases have not been going before the courts, at least based on non-payment of rent because of these moratoria. So um, if it, and when things ever get to that point where tenant and landlord can't reach an agreement and you know we end up having to go to court, um, we're not really sure how this will all shake out. Um, a lot of times with landlord tenant uh, court, um, there's a mediation process where you know even when you do get to court, um, you go in a room with a mediator and try to hash things out and reach an agreement with a neutral party. So there are a lot of steps involved. Um, and so it remains to be seen how that will all work, but we probably won't start to even see that until at least after June at this point, maybe later. In the meantime, in terms of getting tenants um, help, um, I mentioned the mortgage assistance for landlords. Um, for tenants, uh, PPP has reopened and it's still open, I haven't run out of funds yet. Um, that can give you, you know, additional money to go toward rent and help cover payroll, uh, which if you meet the requirements, then it, it's forgiven. So that's ideal because it helps chip away at the deferred rent and also helps keep your employees uh, on staff. Uh, we also have the American Rescue uh, Plan or Act that is coming. Uh, so there's going to be more federal stimulus and economic relief from that. Uh, and as I mentioned, the governor's executive order did extend um, city's ability to push their moratoria out to the end of June uh, of this year, but there could be further extensions. In terms of business interruption insurance coverage, I mentioned that earlier. Um, the court decisions on sort of how, how this plays in with the pandemic have been pretty unfavorable. That's been one of the areas where I've actually seen some, some decisions and courts weighing in. Uh, there were um, originally a couple cases in the UK that where the courts determined that the policy at issue did cover business interruption caused by the pandemic. And um, in the US, the decisions had been pretty unfavorable until a few decisions in federal two different federal courts in Ohio. And they reached completely different decisions. One said that the business interruption coverage did apply. The other did not said it did not. And so um, both of those cases are likely to be appealed and some decision issued by the appellate court and potentially the Supreme Court, which depending on which way it goes, could be um, really helpful or could be um, disappointing uh, in terms of just getting extra help from existing coverage. Uh, really, to the extent you can continue to look for um, community financial resources, there are new ones that come out almost every day. Um, they can be refunded. I'm sure there's more funding coming to cities through the, the rescue plan and, and things like that uh, in states. And so uh, some of the programs that are closed now may reopen. There could be private donors that you know are providing funding. So uh, continue to look just because it says it's closed now doesn't mean that it will be forever. Um, other resources, um, you can get up to a one month supply of PPE uh, through the SFOEWD page, um, which I'll, I'll show the link to here in a second, but it provides all kinds of resources for businesses and, um, and tenants. Uh, there's also the shared spaces program where you can get the, the no cost expedited permit uh, so that you can use the sidewalk or put in a parklet. And this is a screenshot both on this slide and the next one uh, of the different programs that are available. So I mentioned PPP, the SF Shines um, for reopening, California Rebuilding Fund, and you know some of these are grants 
So $5,000 that you don't have to repay. Others are forgivable loans, um, fixed um, long-term loans. That's what EL EIDL and the rebuilding fund are. There's relief grants, um, save our stages. These two are both uh, about to open, but not quite there yet. And then there's also code relief grants and community investment loans. Um, and the investment loans can be uh, low to 0%. Um, there's obviously an interest in grants first, right? Because that's money that you don't have to pay back. But um, you know, these long-term loans at little to no interest can also be a, a good way to just sort of spread out the costs that have been incurred over the last year and just make it a little bit easier month to month to keep chipping away at that and uh, potentially move forward with your landlord um, at the same time. So um, the Lawyers Committee's website does provide additional resources. It's lccrsf.org. Um, you can also apply to the uh, LSE program for a one hour consultation. Um, and if you need longer term representation, there's a possibility that uh, the Lawyers Committee can refer you out uh, to a lawyer if there's a, an extended dispute, if you and your landlord eventually do go to court, that sort of thing. And it's this tiny URL forward slash LSE application. And there are also plentiful business resources related to the pandemic on the OEWD website. Um, if you just search on Google SF OEWD, um, it will uh, pull up the page. There's a big red button that says COVID-19 resources. And then there's another smaller blue one for businesses. And it will list all the different uh, funding options and different resources that I, some of which I showed on my screen just a short time ago. Um, all right, so we've got even more questions since the last time that I looked. Um, so I will try to go through some of these here. Anna, do you want to send me in the order that they've come in? Are you going to do that again? Yes, I can do that. Um, okay. Let me send it from, I think you answered some of them pretty easily. Okay. Thanks everyone for your patience. This is the most questions that we've gotten in a, in a presentation before. So I appreciate the, um, everybody being active participants and, um, and uh, posing your questions. Okay. All right. So the financial statements, I think I mentioned that before it's, you know, check and see if the lease requires it. Um, you as the landlord can ask for it, but unless there's a reason under the lease that they have to provide it, the tenant may elect not to do that. Um, perhaps you can reach some sort of agreement where the tenant is willing to you know, show you some evidence. But as I mentioned, it can be pretty evident that there's been a slowdown in business um, such that the, the tenant can't pay. Um, but it's just a matter of finding something that's workable for both of you unless the lease requires it. Um, so the tenant is supposed to provide written communication monthly. Um, if you haven't heard from the tenant, you know, they haven't communicated and said that they're not able to pay rent, then you can send the um, written notice of intent to, you know, commence eviction proceedings, but then the tenant has to have 30 days to pay it. And so if the tenant then says, you know, I'm in writing, uh, I'm unable to pay rent because of the pandemic, then it starts that process over again. Um, I am not aware of, of situations where the tenant, you know, missed a month of providing written notice or didn't initially provide it, um, both with the local moratorium and then also the CDC guidelines that um, have prohibited residential evictions, um, you know, that would be more of a technicality than like an actual basis to say that the, the tenant could be evicted. Um, So there's a question about the lease termination portion of the moratorium. So that option, it's still a little unclear because the, the board passed the ordinance in December. It went into effect in January. Um, still have not seen a whole lot about it uh, in the news or even on the city's website. And so as far as I understand it, uh, based on what's out there, is it's, it remains an option as long as the moratorium period is in effect. Uh, and so once the moratorium uh, ends, and that option will go away. Um, the tenant, um, if the tenant doesn't exercise that option, the 24 month period for repayment of deferred rent would still apply. And so it's really, that's where the 
you know, continued communication comes in. That's where the, um, you know, finding something that's workable for both of you so that you, the landlord can get paid. And so the tenant can continue to operate the business and earn a living. Um, you know, that's why those uh, mutual, mutually beneficial agreements are so important. Um, so we've talked about, you know, if tenants aren't paying the rent um, and it's because of the pandemic, they're covered by the moratorium. Um, which I understand as a landlord is frustrating, particularly if you um, it's a sole or a primary source of income. And I did mention that there is an exception, an exception for um, for more mom and pop uh, landlords who only own one or a handful of properties under certain square footage. I think it's if you own under 25,000 square feet, uh, don't quote me on that. But um, if you're below a certain threshold, then you can apply for a waiver or an exemption from the moratorium and you know communicate why there's a hardship if you're not allowed to evict the non-paying tenant because it's your sole source of income. I think the question there is, are you gonna be able to find a tenant to take that space over if you do evict the tenant? Um, and so there's, that's where it kind of comes back to that balancing of, you know, is there a long-term goal where, you know, the, the tenant's business does come back and the tenant can start repaying the deferred rent versus going through the process of evicting the tenant and then not being able to find someone to take over the space or finding someone, but they're only willing to pay much less in rent because we all know how the market has gone down, the percentage of vacancies that we have in the city. And so it may be that you're you know, not able to find someone who can pay as much as the tenant that you have you know, is required to under his or her lease. So all things to keep in mind, which is where it comes back to the landlord and the tenant each you know, finding what's gonna work best for them. Um, So there's a question about being able to terminate once the, the re rent reduction expires. Um, the, the ordinance is really focused on disagreements about repayment of deferred rent. So if the landlord has waived rent uh, or reduced the deferred rent or you're current on the deferred rent um, and you know, you're paying the, the reduced rent going forward, um, that would be more a situation where you need to reach out to the landlord and have resume that conversation and say, you know, very much appreciate your waiver or reduction of the deferred rent. Glad that we were able to pay that back. Um, you know, thank you for also for reducing the rent you know, during this period. Uh, but where the business is at, you know, we're still not going to be able to pay full rent. And so what can we do? Like, can we, can we continue the reduction? Can, you know, would you be willing to you know, still allow us to pay less rent, but then defer that and give us more time to pay it back. That's when this whole negotiation would maybe start over again. So open dialogue, communication, really, really key there. Um, but it really, for the ordinance to apply, at least the way that I understand it is that, um, and the way that it's written, is that there has to be some sort of disagreement about deferred rent. And so if there is no deferred rent and it's about future rent, that would be a sort of negotiation, future conversation, not a grounds to terminate. Um, question about if the landlord said you don't have to pay rent through March and need to start paying full rent in April through June. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier um, where it's really important to just level with each other, landlord to the tenant, tenant to the landlord, and, um, you know, listen to each other. Um, you know, I think the idea that businesses that have been closed through, you know, the end of January and limited capacity, only doing outdoor service, those sorts of things. Clearly business is not back to normal. Um, the idea that a business that was closed and reopened with the number of people who've moved out of the city, the number of people who aren't going out, who aren't vaccinated, there's just very few situations where it's realistic to expect a business to be able to pay full rent just because they reopened um, after the shutdown. So this comes back to just being honest, being open, and just trying to work out something that works for both of you. Because if you're a landlord and you're imposing a burden on the tenant and the tenant can't meet that burden, what's gonna happen? The business is gonna close and you're not gonna get any rent. So what's better for you as a landlord getting some rent now, getting the rest of it later, um, or getting no rent and having to evict the current tenant and find a new one? It's It all plays into the picture. Um, and again, I can't say what's the best situation for you, but um, it's what you need to consider both landlord and tenant there. 
Um, in terms of bankruptcy, um, you know, if the business is a separate corporation, LLC entity, you know, there is a way where you can wind up a business and close it and whatever assets, cash on hand, whatever um, remains will be divvied up among the creditors. But if you personally guaranteed the lease, that would give the landlord grounds to come after you personally for the unpaid rent. So that's really a subject for consultation where someone needs to have eyes on your lease and see what, what your obligations are. Um, so I see that businesses have been who have been able to pay rent under the ordinance, that would be the same thing. So there have been some businesses I've talked to who you know have not had to close down uh, and they've been able to continue operating. And again, with the option to terminate, that's really for businesses who are in a position where there's no way that they can repay the deferred rent. There's no concession or you know offer that the landlord could give them absent waiver or forgiveness of the deferred rent that would make it possible for them to pay it back. So it's really meant to be a last, uh, last resort versus a way to terminate a lease early. Um, keep that in mind. Um, some of these other questions here. Um, so if your landlord's not communicating back, um, keep trying. Um, hopefully at some point he or she will um, try a phone call, try to you know, send a written letter, send an email, you know, try all those things, but just make sure you're sending your monthly communications to the extent that you can. Um, it can help really to provide a confirmation, do like a certified letter so that you know that it's been delivered and you have written confirmation of it. And also to require a read receipt uh, on the email and that goes for landlords and tenants. So that way you each have proof that whatever you're sending has been received by the other party. Um, it's just a way for you to confirm that it's at least been received, even if um, there's no response there. Had a question about um, if the moratorium may be extended uh, past June 30th. I can't say for sure. Um, given the way things are going in Southern California compared to up here, it could be. Uh, it depends on the impact that the stimulus has. It depends on the vaccination rate now that Johnson & Johnson is back online. You know, we could, or not back online. Now that they're available, you know, we're going to see a huge spike, I hope, in vaccination rates and just, you know, getting closer and closer to the point where we can, you know, get into the orange tier and reopen. Um, percentage of the market value. Um, that would be a good thing to Google. I haven't looked for a while. I know in November or December, something like 5,000 Bay Area businesses had closed. It's, you know, hundreds of thousands of businesses nationwide. So, um, that would just be a good thing to, to consider. If you and your landlord are debating about, you know, maybe renegotiating your lease and setting a new monthly rent, I would look for comparable spaces in the neighborhood and see if you can find something so that you can, you know, show what a new tenant would be paying, that sort of thing. Um, database about whether the landlord owns additional property. Property records are public, so you could look for the landlord's uh, name there. If, if it's like a company, you could see that. Um, or you could just, you know, have a conversation with the landlord. I, you would you would know if the landlord was seeking a waiver to the moratorium, you know, well before um, any eviction would take place. So. I don't know that you need to go to that level, but you may be able to look into the property records um, through City Hall. There's got to be a website um, or a page. Um, it might be the auditor's or the clerk's office. But um, if you just search San Francisco property records or California property records, you may be able to find that. All right, and I see that Anna posted the link to sign up for an LSE session. Um, I think I got through the questions. I don't know if anyone else has any others that they want to share? I do, we did go a little bit over, I apologize for that, but I appreciate all the questions and um, your willingness there to give me time to answer them. All right. That was all the questions. Okay, everyone. sounds good. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no you go. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share with everyone that we will be providing um, the webinar recording as well as the um, 
presentation slides over um, email in the next couple of days. Um, so just to uh, watch out for that. Um, and also those the, the recording in Spanish will also be provided. Great. Well, thank you all very much and um, wish you all the best of luck and encourage you very much to sign up for a consultation. Um, it's a great way to just get some free legal advice, um, whether you're a landlord or a, or a tenant, um, and just have someone, you know, take a look at, at everything and at least answer some questions. Um, to the extent we can save you on legal fees, you know, we, we love to do that and um, at least help get you in the right direction. So please reach out. And um, if you have follow-up questions about the presentation, you can just email LSE and I'm happy to, to field those and answer them as well. Um, I do see a few more questions that popped up. Um, Anna, for the financial information that they asked for on the application, that's just, I've seen some people provide their like tax information for 2019, but they just enter that on the application form, right? Yes, and if it if your financial picture has obviously changed, then we can talk about it. Just go ahead and apply, um, and when someone will reach out to you from our team, um, and then if not, if you do not qualify for our services, we can find support um, for you elsewhere. Yep, great. Um, yeah, so you you apply to the program, and then you're you're referred out to lawyers like me. So there is a process, and there's a dialogue. So. You don't stress too much about what you should and shouldn't provide. You know, if they need information from you, they'll ask for it. Um, and you know, just answer the the application form to the best of your knowledge, and um, they'll they'll reach out. I did see a couple yeah. more questions about um, whether the moratorium applies to storage. Um, that one, I think, I would need a little more information there. It would be you would need to be a commercial tenant, not necessarily just like a storage facility. And I, there was also a question, I know the board ordinance said that it did not apply to office spaces um, unless you're a nonprofit organization, there is a carve out for nonprofits. Um, so that would be a good good reason for a consultation just to double check sort of the zoning and what your lease actually is. Um, but just because you're zoned as office space, if you're actually like a commercial tenant operating a food establishment or something, that in my mind would qualify, but that's something you'd wanna talk about with one of the, the volunteer lawyers. And I do see, so someone had a consultation last year, uh, wondering if you can have another one. Um, if you'd like to meet with the same person again, uh, you can just reach out to the, the LSE uh, email and just say who you met with. And if that person's willing to meet with you again, that can make it easier to answer your question uh, because you you know each other and that person has reviewed your lease and knows the state of your business. I've done follow-up meetings with Quite a few of the tenants that I've met with, I'm always happy to do it. Um, so unless there's any reason that the lawyers committee, you know, can't can't take a second one, that, you know, there would be a possibility to, to do that, as far as I know. Um, yeah. So any the, additional questions regarding the one-hour consultation, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I provided my email in the chat box. Um, but thank you so much, Jake. For yep, I do see that. Yeah, no, yeah, reach out to Anna, to Anna and uh, thank you all for showing up and uh, have a good rest of your week. Thank you, and thank you to our interpreter, Anna, for providing the interpretation in Spanish. Yes. And um, to our community partner, Meta, as well. Yes, yeah, Meta and um, the SF Office for Small Business. Uh, thank you uh, for partnering with us for this. All right, take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.